Hi, it's Brendan here. Before we kick off with this week's podcast, I want to let you know about a very exciting online event. At 6.15pm on Wednesday the 20th of December, I'll be hosting a very special live recording of this podcast with Matthew Goodwin, the esteemed political scientist and author of Values, Voice and Virtue, The New British Politics. Matt will be joining me to talk about the state of the Conservative Party, the state of the Labour Party, the rise and rise of the new elites, and whether the populist revolt still has some fizzle left in it. We'll also be taking questions from you, the audience. This is a free event exclusive to Spike supporters. So if you're already a member of Spike supporters, our online donor community, head over to the online donor hub now to register and claim your free ticket. If you're not a Spike supporter, now is the perfect time to sign up. For as little as £5 a month, you can grab your ticket for this event and enjoy loads of other exclusive perks too, including ad-free reading, access to our comments section, and access to other events like this one. Become a Spike supporter now at spiked-online.com slash supporters. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. I hope to see you at 6.15pm on Wednesday the 20th of December with Matt Goodwin. Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Batya Ungar-Sargan. Batya, welcome to the show. Um, I am beyond grateful to be here with you, Brendan, at a time um, of a lot of upheaval. Uh, You have been a voice of just stalwart moral clarity in an environment that is not conducive to that. And I, I just, I just, your, your listeners have to know, I mean, they know this about you because they follow you and they listen to you, but, um, as a Jewish person to scroll on Instagram and see so much hate, and then to see your posts come shining through as this beacon, it's so incredibly powerful. And, you know, I, we we talk amongst ourselves like how how does it happen that um, in the midst of so much moral depravity, somebody can arrive at just the most you know it should be basic humanity, but it's not. And you you really go above and beyond. And so, if I may bogart this a little bit, <laughs> how is it that you? Um, have arrived at this position of such moral clarity um, at a time when, you know, cravenness and amorality and defense of the indefensible is has is the norm. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I'm I'm touched, I'm flattered. And you know I feel this exact same way about your writing and the things you commission uh, as, as in your role as an editor. Um, you bring extraordinary moral clarity to so many different issues, and I want to dig into some of those today. But on on that question that you raise, I mean, it is it is a big question. How does one arrive at moral clarity on some of the most confused issues of our time? And one of those that you've touched on there is the Israel question. Israel versus Hamas, the fallout from the 7th of October pogrom, um, very early on, in the first few hours of that terrible event, we called it a pogrom on Spiked, when the, the death toll was 20, but very, at that time, very early on, we knew this was one of the most sinister events of our time. It was very obviously an attack, not only on a nation's sovereignty, but on the Jewish people. It was clear to us very early on. And I think one of the reasons we were able to recognize that is because we have followed the Israel-Palestine discussion for a long time. And it's been clear for a long time, I think, that it is now bound up fairly intimately with Western moral decay and a loss of faith in Western civilization itself. So I think a lot of people in the West hate Israel because they see it as embodying Western values, civilizational values, ideas and ideals that they have been educated to turn their backs on. And in some cases, to hate. So uh, one thing that has really interested me over the past two decades is the way in which Israel bashing and Israel phobia is expressive of a broader loss of faith in Western society, especially, sadly, amongst younger generations. And I think that's become even clearer over the past six or seven weeks, don't you think? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 
uh, it's so interesting the way that you're framing it, that they, you know, the very things that should make somebody stand with Israel and understand Israel's plight and understand of uh, uh, why it's important are the reasons that the West or certain people and factions in the left are turning on it. And I, I totally agree with you. And I, I think that this, um, if there is a silver lining here, it's been um, the exposure of the moral decay and the moral rot um, in certain I- factions, institutions. I'm very curious to talk to you about what I think I have been seeing as the difference between the United States and the UK in terms of how this is developing, because I've been getting into arguments with people um, over things like anti-Semitism and the spread and where it's coming from and where it's going. And I think, you know, if you are getting your sense of this moment from Twitter, it's all going to bleed into itself. Um, there's not going to be much of a difference in your uh, experience of a video of a mass protest in London and a mass protest in Washington, D.C., um, in support of the Palestinian cause. Um, but to me, being on the ground here, um, I my feeling as somebody who lives in a neighborhood with a lot of Muslims, who is very publicly, visibly Jewish and, and, um, but spends a lot of time in public on the streets, on the subways. Um, to me, the relationship between the Jewish and the Muslim communities in America is very different than it is in Europe. And I see the current moment in America as very much driven by elite discourse and having very little purchase in the working class and the middle class, including middle class Muslims who may agree with, you know, they may in their hearts side with Palestine's, you know, agree with the attack on October 7th, but they it would never um, manifest as anything because they're middle class. And in America being working class, being middle class, um, having a sense of what that means in terms of your neighbors, in terms of your civic duties, in terms of your opportunities, in terms of your citizenship. Um, I think to me, it feels like the Muslim community feels that it is very much here in America um, at the beneficence of the Christian community or the the civic community that has established certain a certain relationship with its Jewish community over time. And so everything you're seeing, the vandalism, the marching, the chanting is either on college campuses or college adjacent and very much a product of the elites and stuck in that space, thank God. And as proof of this, not just my own experience, but I've been checking in with all of my Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox friends, communities. I'm in an Orthodox community full of women who look much more Jewish and religious than I do. And nobody, thank God, has experienced anything. And these are communities that two, three years ago, four years ago, 2019, 2020, were being physically attacked on the regular, uh, mostly by young Black kids in Brooklyn. It was part of some kind of a meme, I guess it is, a very violent um, expression of, of of their malcontent or what have you. This was before COVID. Um, just hundreds and hundreds of physical attacks against Orthodox um, and Haredi Jews in Brooklyn um, that, of course, the elites who have a problem with anti-Semitism on the left didn't care about it all and did nothing to address. But none of that is happening now. And I take so much heart in that because I do think that there is this feeling that, you know, America is not going to turn its back on its Jews. But I think in Europe, where you have this history, you have this culture, you have millennia of politicians using anti-Semitism to rouse up support in the working classes and you have now mass migration from Muslim communities and countries where people are deeply anti-Semitic and they do believe um, deeply anti-Semitic things. And then you have that meeting, this bizarre censoriousness, like this bizarre, like you have much more um, purchase for anti-Semitic ideas in the working class and in the masses, but then also this weird European Union, Brussels-driven censorship campaign that has no commitment to free speech, that is willing to say, we're going to make it illegal to wave the Palestinian flag. And I think that that is making, that is creating this um like much worse situation. And I guess that I would add, I would, I would put that to you. Like, do you recognize, do you think that this is an accurate assessment of the situation? I think that the way you've framed some of that is really interesting, especially in the U S context versus the European context. And 
here in the UK, we have some similar dynamics to the one you, ones you've just described in America. So, for example, on campuses, amongst the elite, new, up-and-coming, woke generation, there is a lot of anti-Zionism that very often crosses the line into something much darker than that. I mean, I, I increasingly cannot tell the difference between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, and I want to ask you about that in a moment. Um, so we have a lot of it on campuses. Just to give you one example, the Union of Jewish Students here sent out a template letter to every student union in the country um, condemning anti-Semitism, condemning Hamas, and uh, calling for the return of the Israeli hostages. Five student unions signed it. So uh, hundreds of student unions just flat out refused to sign a letter condemning a form of racism and condemning a, a reactionary medieval terror group that hates Jewish people. And it's so fascinating, as, as you will know, these are the kind of student activists who think it's racist to ask someone, where are you from? Who think, you know, who think that an unwanted come on in the student bar is a form of rape culture, and yet they have nothing to say about the uh, rapes and brutalization of women committed by Hamas. You know, as people now say, me too, unless you're a Jew. So we have all those um, campus problems that you guys have there as well in relation to anti-Semitism. I think we also have a crisis of Muslim integration. So it's really interesting to hear what you say about working class Muslims in the US. I wouldn't want to overstate the crisis of Muslim integration in the UK. It is a real problem, though. There are significant minorities within the Muslim community who have not been integrated into British values in relation to equality, gay equality, female equality, and so on. And anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are often found within sections of the Muslim community. So there's a real problem there. Um, as for the working classes here, it's kind of difficult to tell. My instinct, my, my optimistic instinct is that I think right now, even despite Europe's dark history of anti-Semitism, I think a lot of working class people are looking at the radicalized demonstrations against Israel and the expressions of open forms of hatred. And I think they're probably looking at them with a growing sense of alarm and horror and concern at what is taking place. We saw Geert Wilders have a very surprising victory in the Dutch elections. I wouldn't be surprised if that was influenced in part by the events of the past six or seven weeks. Um, so I think something interesting is happening in the working class where they are recognizing that a largely elite uh, ideology, which says Israel is uniquely evil and Muslims are uniquely oppressed, they're recognizing that that doesn't stack up and probably runs counter to their own view of the world and their own interests. So a lot of interesting stuff is going on. But I, I did want to ask you specifically about the elite nature of some of the hatreds that we've seen in the US, particularly on campuses. Some of the stuff that's happened on American campuses over the past few weeks has been really chilling. We've seen Jew Jewish students be physically attacked. We've seen them hiding in libraries away from the mob. We've seen George Washington University, they projected onto the wall there, um, glory to our martyrs, which, by which they mean Hamas, the, the, the racists of Hamas. Even given all the commentary you've put out into the world about the um, loss of moral normalcy among that section of society, have you been taken aback by, by some of this? You know, I was protested. I was invited to give a talk on a panel at Bard about anti-Semitism in 2019, I think it was. And I was protested by the pro-Palestinian group. Um, and while they were sort of protesting the panel, I was sort of asking them, like, do you not understand, like, what you're doing is deeply racist? Um, but I, so because it had happened to me already, um, um, I, I, I was not so surprised. Um, it, I will say, um, I think there's a very big difference between what's happening now and what's happening in, let's say, 2021, which was the last sort of conflagration between Israel and Hamas, where back then you really felt like everyone was, it, 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 there were no pockets of people who were like, wow, um, I've been wrong about this. <laughs> like, it turns out the side I was championing um, defends rape. Like, you know, there was none of that. It was, it, I mean, you know, it was also a much more murky episode. Um, the harm to Israel was much smaller. And so relative to that, the harm to the Palestinians in Gaza was much greater. Hamas was 
seemed like a much weaker organization than it does now. It's pulled off something at, uh, astronomical now that nobody thought was possible. So it was murkier, and it, but it was very different. It felt much more lonely. But I think also the response this time around to a left that feels that it is in retreat and that what felt that it was gaining ground and is now losing ground has been even more sociopathic in nature. I will say... Um, I don't like this language of safetyism. Um, and I, I, those kids hiding in that library, I didn't like that. Like these, we're talking about academic leftists. These people are cowards to their core. Like the idea that they would actually like physically accomplish something is just, it's like you, if you've met these people, you spent any time on university, you know that they are cowards. They only act in, in groups, in mobs, you know, they're not the type to, to, to throw punches. And, and even so, I just feel that, um, the moment is to stand up and be strong and proud in who you are. And I hated the safetyism when it was for other minorities. And I hate it that it's now being utilized to convey to Jewish students that they are in danger when I think they are not. There was one episode where um, a student had been filming people at a protest and he does seem to have been pushed and, you know, I've been in situations where it is scary to stand up for what you believe in. It's scary to stand up online for what you believe in. But the idea that they are unsafe, I think, comes out of this way of thinking about a university education in which it is um, a luxury uh, product, which is what it's become in America. It's becoming extremely expensive. And that's where a lot of this safetyist language comes from, because because it is so expensive and because it is a luxury product, the students and the parents of the students, um, d they are consumers. They're not there to be educated. They're consumers of a luxury good. And so they have demanded increasingly corporatized safetyist conditions, which we've all all known were ridiculous in the past, like that they cannot be exposed to, you know, the, the viewpoints of people they disagree with because it is, it makes them unsafe to hear from somebody who doesn't believe that, you know, that, you know, women should do, trans women should be allowed to compete against young girls. Um, and so I, I, that's being deployed now. Um, and it, the idea that a bunch of people, you know, 500 people, 200 people, 50 people chanting something you don't like that's gross is makes you unsafe. I, I totally reject that. And I don't feel unsafe. And I, I, you know, even recently I had somebody scream at me in an airport. I, I just don't, I, the, the moment is to be strong. And especially when you think about what 18 year olds in Israel are doing to defend the Jewish people, the idea that we are going to crumple and fall because a, a bunch of sociopaths are marching down our street, like with, a, with a sign, it just goes against everything I believe in both as an American and as a Jew. Hi, it's Brendan here. I just wanted to remind you that you can still buy my book. It's called A Heretic's Manifesto, Essays on the Unsayable. And I've really been blown away by the response to it from readers, reviewers, Spike supporters. People really like this book. And I think you're going to like it too. It covers all the insanities of our time from climate change hysteria through to COVID authoritarianism, through to the trans ideology. And it basically makes the case for more freedom of speech, more debate and more heretical thinking to challenge the conformism of our times. So what are you waiting for? Go to Amazon right now and order my book, A Heretic's Manifesto, Essays on the Unsayable. And now on with the show. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And it, uh, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because I've seen some of your commentary on why Jewish kids on campuses sh should reject the ideology of safetyism and the practice of safetyism. I really agree. And I've had numerous debates with British um, Jewish students here in Britain over the past 10 or 15 years, I think, um, about this very issue, because often they will say, you know, we're really ticked off because the safe space ideas never apply to us. We can never hold a safe meeting because our meetings are always being invaded by supposedly pro-Palestinian students. We get shouted at, we get um, subjected to harassment and abuse. And it, it, it's all true all of this happens but the question is how does how does one interpret it what does one do about it do do you slink into your own safe space to protect yourself from the others and i think that's the wrong way to go about it for all the reasons you outline but but it's also wrong isn't it because 
the ideology of the safe space is the cause of so many of these problems. So, you know, if you look, for example, on British campuses, um, there have been numerous instances over the past few years where Jewish students have tried to organise a meeting. They've invited maybe someone from the IDF or someone from the Israeli embassy in London uh, to speak on their campus. And they are protested against, they're harassed. Sometimes the meetings are invaded and chairs are thrown around and so on. But what's striking about the students doing the protesting and the harassing is that they justify their actions in the language of the safe space. So what they will say is that this meeting of Jewish students and these people from Israel is threatening to our sense of safety. It is undermining our sense of, as, you know, ethnic minority students or Muslim students, our sense of psychic security on the campus. So you can't combat the ideology of the safe space by embracing it. It, it. It's the cause of some of these problems in the first place, isn't it? In terms of the competitive victimhood, the re-racialization of politics, the demonization of certain people with difficult ideas or people who just happen to be Jews. A lot of that does spring from the campus ideologies that have grown up over the past few years. A hundred percent. You know, the Jewish, some Jews on the left are are very upset that, you know, that the DEI framework, right, diversity, equity and inclusion, intersectional framework doesn't give them a high enough ranking on the scale of oppression. And it's like, that's not the problem with intersectionality is not that they don't rank you high enough. It's that they rank people based on oppression. And, you know, it's 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 a viewpoint that worships weakness and victimization. And that is the viewpoint that leads leftists to defend Hamas, either explicitly or implicitly. Um, I'm sure you've seen this on social media, people desperate to create some narrative in which the Hamas captors were treating the the captives in a way that made the captives love them. Like, it's just, the you know, it, I was thinking this morning, like, Not everybody who feels that way. Some people went out and actually said that on social media and got a lot of, you know, retweets and so forth. But many, many more leftists than are willing to admit it have been having those thoughts because they can't help it because their whole worldview is based around seeing the person with less power as inherently more virtuous. Being in a relationship in which you have less power than the other party gives you, is the only form of virtue that the left still recognizes. And so it is inherently pro-Hamas. And the problem there is not like that the Jews in Israel are actually weaker or actually more vulnerable. The problem is that there is a difference between right versus wrong, you know, like this exists. It's not just powerful versus powerless. And we have to, we like, we have to, the the other thing I wanted to bring up, because I think you, you will probably agree with me about this as well is, you know, the problem is not just that, um, universities have become cesspools pools of anti-Semitism. Um, they've probably always kind of, you know, post-structuralism, post-colonialism is not new, right? I mean, co- college campuses in the 70s, you know, Arafat would, you know, in the 80s would send these like lovely young, you know, mustachioed, you know, terrorists to, to, to woo the women of like universities and so forth. And like, this is not, none of this is new. What is new is that in America, at least, the path to the American dream necessarily goes through the college campus. So it used to be that we had a more equitable society that sort of peaked in the early 70s and it's been on a downswing ever since where you could choose to go to college or you could choose not to go to college, but there wouldn't be at the end of your career a million dollar difference between having made that decision. There wouldn't be um, a 40% chance less of not ever being able to buy a home based on that decision. You could become an electrician, you could be you could go into construction. You know, there were, there were a lot of ways to achieve the American dream through factory work, even the service industry, where um, you didn't have to go through college to have the basics of what it means to have a middle class life, own your own home, retire in dignity, have adequate health care. Today, to have those things, you have to go to a, co- a university, you have to have a college degree because um, the elites created an economy that is in- unbelievably punishing to the working class um, and that only rewards 
ha- people with a college degree. This started under Clinton and really, really turbocharged under Obama, who truly believed that if you did not have a college degree, you did not deserve the American dream. And his entire economic platform was based around that, which of course was reversed by President Trump, who kind of believed the opposite. Um, and so to me, when I'm looking at this moment and I'm seeing these elites with their disgusting view of me and my people and th- my country, America and Israel, this country that I feel very strongly about. Um, They hate America. They hate Israel. They hate the Jews. And they want to destroy everything that is good about this place. But they are the only people whose children are going to be better off than they are. They are the only people who are able to have the American dream. And meanwhile, the working class, the vast working class, you know, three quarters of this country um, who don't have a college degree, but who are towing the line on every value that matters. Like, how is that fair? And so I feel renewed in this and and I, I, I feel renewed in calling on Jews to support this view that it's not enough to say like the colleges, the university system is a disgusting cesspool of hate and you don't have to take anything that comes out of there seriously. Fine. Yes. You know, like, I don't know if you've ever met anyone who goes to Harvard, but they do this very obnoxious thing where if you ask them, if somebody asks them, where did you go to college? They'll say, oh, in Cambridge, because they think if they say the word Harvard, you will simply melt in, you know, you won't be able to withstand the power of their privilege and education and they must hide it from you. It's so obnoxious. But now I'm hoping the opposite will happen. Like they'll they'll be embarrassed to say they go to Harvard because Harvard is the place that supports Hamas, right? But it's not enough for us to say like, we know now, like we know that you spent four years, eight years, 12 years, if you're, you know, in a place that has indoctrinated you to believe there's no difference between right and wrong. We have to take the next step and create an economy that reverses that thing where the best of us have the most precarious lives, even as they are the ones who are sustaining our democracies and the worst of us are the ones leading everything who have access to all of the benefits. Yeah, that's very well put. And we have, you will know that we have very similar problems in the UK, maybe not quite as developed, but we have, you know, the the problem here of the elite is increasingly made up of university educated people. Uh, You have to go to a particular university and sometimes do a particular course in order to win entrance to the, those sections of society and to win entrance into the corridors of power. Um, and then we have a working class who are increasingly side, sidelined from political life, from moral life, whose values and, and, and community lives are looked upon with complete disdain. They're, they're treated as gammon. That's the word people use to refer to red faced working class men. Gammon, of course, gammon means pig. Um, they're looked upon as unintelligent, um, low information. That's a euphemism for thick. I mean, this is how they are talked about by the new cognitive elites who uh, have dominion over almost every form of political and cultural power now. So we have a similar problem. And I, 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 I am hopeful, although you were right to raise this question at the beginning, I am hopeful that some of the um, nastiest ideas that are around at the moment, including in relation to Israel and Jewish people, I, I think they are more pronounced among the elite section of society, whereas there is a well of common sense, as there are on so many other issues, the trans issue, for example, or uh, identity politics more broadly, there is a well of common sense where ordinary people reject that stuff. One point I made recently is that, um, you know, one thing that I think where my patience might run out is, you know, for how much longer can the silent majority be silent? You know, maybe it's time that they now actually say things a bit more clearly. And I think if we see that happening, that will be very positive. But I, di- I did want to ask you about, um, you mentioned there the role of victim culture in relation to all of this and the tendency of these new elite movers and influencers to side with what they see as the victim side in every conflict. I thought you were absolutely right about the way they talk about Hamas hostage taking where they say, well, they treated them nicely because Hamas are good guys. At the end of the day, they've got more virtue on, on because precisely because they're the weaker party in this conflict. I've seen people on the left here say that Hamas has treated its hostages nicely. They've actually used that word nicely. And then this morning on the day we're talking, I read about Emily Hand, the nine-year-old Irish Israeli girl who was kidnapped when she was eight 
So she had her ninth birthday in captivity. She's now been released back to her father. And he said today that she is deeply disturbed. She thinks she was taken hostage for more than a year. Um, she can't sleep. Um, she bursts into tears. She speaks in a whisper because she's conditioned not to speak out loud. Uh, otherwise, presumably, there'd be a form of punishment. And you read this stuff and you think, I think people sometimes underestimate the extent of the moral collapse that has taken place within the upper class sections of society, within the elites, that they can refer to an event like that with language like nice, when it was so obviously uh, the dehumanization of a child, and even worse, the dehumanization of child, a child on the basis of her race, on the basis of her religion. So it, doesn't this speak to, you know, you and I talk a lot about the problematic ideas and values uh, within that section of society, but it speaks to something even more profound, doesn't it? Just a complete loss of any moral sense or any ability to think reasonably and morally about some of the events in our world. Um, I had not heard that report. Um, and her father was the one who had said that he was relieved when he heard she was dead because he couldn't imagine what she was going through. Um, yeah, I mean, the the phrase that I keep coming back to is, um, however much you hate the media, you don't hate them enough. Um, and it is astonishing just the how they have become the stenographers of terrorists. Um, there's nothing Hamas can do that would make them stop taking their word for it and stop giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, I heard somebody the other day, I forget who, say that the, you know, the media and the West, the elites in the West treat Hamas like a, f a rowdy uh, frat house, right? Like uh, sometimes they get out of hand and they go too far, but by and large, they're good guys. I mean, that is really the the feeling you get um, reading the media, watching the media, the leftist media. And um, it, you're right, it is a total breakdown of, and it's just, it's funny because I, I talk about it, but it is so hard for me to... Um, like Im imagine my way back into that way of thinking, but they, you are totally right. They, 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 you know, people ask me, oh, how do you define woke? And I define wokeness as when you take a worldview based on right versus wrong and you replace it with a worldview based on who has more power and who has less. And then you ascribe all virtue to the person who has less, less power and, um, an inherent suspiciousness um, towards people who have the power, and then you superimpose race onto that. So anybody who you perceive to be a person of color um, or marginalized or what have you becomes inherently virtuous based on your perception of them as having no agency and being an inherent victim. Um, and it, you, that is exactly what you're describing, a total inability to decipher the difference between right versus wrong. They don't and especially if, if this if the person pushing this is white, they don't feel that they have um, the credentials to say what is right versus wrong because they have to cede that to the less powerful. It, it is a, a completely amoral system. And we are seeing how this leads people to side with Hamas, whether explicitly or implicitly, people who dismembered children in front of their parents. It's I mean, it's just um it's astonishing. And I think um a lot of it is out in the open. A lot of it is explicit. A lot of it is the New York Times continue to continuing to regurgitate, you know, the 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 casualty numbers from the Gaza Ministry of Health, aka Hamas, just weeks after Hamas made them look like complete idiots for regurgitating their, you know, narrative that Israel had bombed a hospital that's still standing. Um, you know, they they just can't, you know, they can't quit Hamas. They cannot quit Hamas. The New York Times can't quit Hamas. And that that's really what you're seeing is just they can't help but go back to it. Um, and it does go back to our first when we talked about our first conversation, which is my book about the media, because this is not really about politics. It's about class. It's about you know, to, the vast majority of journalists in America have a graduate degree 
and have a degree, often from an elite university. They've been swimming in this worldview for eight years before they hit the job. And so they're totally compromised at that point. They see their job as not to tell the truth, but to bring, you know, a version of quote unquote justice to the world. And they have a totally naive view of what that looks like based on the actual cartoonish evil of the United States, which was based on race. And so, it, it, you know, the, a total inability to act like humans and um, a complete hubris vis-a-vis their audience, who in many times um, is much more moral than they are, which is why people are totally losing respect for the media. Um, yeah, no, I often um, think back to your book. So uh, it, anyone who hasn't read it should read it. Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. That was the first thing we talked about a couple of years ago, and it's still it's as pertinent now as it was then. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a few questions for you about the media and other things happening in the US in particular. But I did just one more question I wanted to ask you about Hamas, um, Hamas and Israel, because it does seem to me that you know, the victim culture that you described very well there and and the, the tendency of the identitarian left, the new elites to side with the supposed victim. It seems to me that that's now gone beyond just being ridiculous and irritating to being actually possibly dangerous, because it seems pretty clear to me from the things we've seen in recent weeks that there is now a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship between the ideology of victimhood in influential circles in the West and the way in which Hamas itself operates. So if you look at the interview with um, Hamad Ghazi, for example, he did an interview on Lebanese TV. He was formerly uh, on the political bureau of Hamas. He's held numerous positions. He's still very high up in Hamas. He gave an interview in which he said numerous repulsive things, including we will do this again and again. Um, there will be October the 7th, October the 10th, October 1 million. You know, we will never stop is essentially what he was saying. And he said, we want to destroy Israel. Um, He also said, we are the victims and no one can hold us responsible for what we do. Um, Everything we do is justified. That is how he put it. And he continually played that victim role. And it seems to me that you know, some of what he said was almost verbatim what was said by those students of Harvard at Harvard on the day of the pogrom itself, when they issued that letter signed by numerous campaign groups at Harvard, where they said Israel is entirely to blame for what is happening today. And they wrote that at the exact time that Hamas terrorists were murdering people in their kitchens, in their bedrooms, in in their bunker rooms. They, They said that at that exact moment that all of this is the responsibility of Israel. And Hamas has taken that on board. Now, I'm not saying that Hamas necessarily read that letter by the Harvard kids, although I wouldn't be surprised because it did go around the world. But more to the point, there's a culture in the West of absolving Hamas of responsibility for what it does because it's the victim party in this relationship and therefore it's justifiable. And uh, you see similar arguments here in the West, especially in universities and elsewhere, If you're the victim, you can behave however you want. Everything you do is justified. If you're the trans person who feels that you're not being validated enough, you can kick off, you can go mad, you can go crazy. Um, That seems to me that that's now being globalized. You know, that the uh, politics of identity seems to be globalized. And I would not be surprised if Hamas were to embrace some of those ideas and use them as a justification or a fortification for their anti-Semitic crimes. I think that's such a deep insight. Uh, it's so smart. Uh, it, you know, in some ways, the the Palestinian leadership has, they were sort of, you know, woke avant la lettre, right? Like they've always had this view of themselves as having no responsibilities, right? So they've rejected four offers for a state um, because that is their role. That is their job as the victim is to have, they ha- as a victim, you have no responsibilities, right? I mean, that's essentially the, the, the argument. Um, and what's very funny and ironic is when you see Palestinians in the diaspora who are actually much more radicalized and radical because of woke culture than our Palestinians who live, you know, regular civilians living in the West Bank and in Gaza, um, because um, they really have no responsibilities, you know. And um, I remember talking once to a Palestinian um, who lives in Park Slope, um, one of the neighborhoods with the highest um, 
real estate values in the world and owns a brownstone and saying, there will be no peace until I get my grandfather's grove back or something. And meanwhile, I'm like, gosh, do you know what every Jew on this planet would give for a piece of your real <laughs> estate in Park Slope? Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm joking about, it. I obviously understand the longing for the homeland and the longing for retribution and, and, and things like that. But, um, the view that you're describing and the way in which Hamas met a receptive audience, I think is, is really, really, um, smart and insightful. And I think they couldn't have imagined that the, all of these leftists calling for ceasefire, right? Like doing their dirty work for them. I mean, the just outpouring of like leftists saying that Hamas should be allowed to get away with it effectively, which is what the call for a ceasefire is. Um, I, I do think that when they filmed the atrocities, um, they imagined that they imagined that the, you know, they, in a way they're a little too online, right? Like they thought that this sort of far left woke worldview was much more prevalent than it is. Um, they thought everybody is AOC and we'll justify this and we'll find a way to excuse it and we'll find a way to absolve them of any responsibility. Um, but you, you're so right that this view that having less power means you have zero agency because you are the victims of the evil Jews, the real subject of this story, right? Like the real person that we're going to talk about, the real entity here, um, is shared by Hamas and shared by the leftist elites 100%. Yeah. And it's it's a kind of double racism of identity politics. So on the one hand, there's their, the racism of their unhinged loathing for Israel above all other nations that you see in left circles and elite circles. But then there's also the racism of their infantilization of Palestinian people, even their infantilization of Hamas, who is held to be so childlike and so innocent, I guess, that they're not really in charge of their own behavior and their own actions. They, it, it, that has to all be explained through the adult in this relationship, which is Israel, who they view as the white nation, even though Israel is not a white nation, it's a very diverse nation. So they project that double racism that they have here at home, which says, you know, white people are all privileged and need to be taken down a peg or two. Um, and black people and brown people are all victims and they need our sympathy and our pity. That kind of double-edged racism that they bring to politics here is now being projected onto the Middle East. And I just think that's a recipe for disaster. And it certainly does nothing to discourage Hamas from carrying out similar actions again, because they now know, as you say, that they will have a receptive supportive audience in influential circles in the West. And it's, I just think, a lethal cocktail that has been brewed up. Um, but I did want to ask you about um, the extent to which working class communities can be a line of defense against this stuff. So you've just said there that Hamas may have overplayed its hand or overestimated um, the number of wokesters in the West, because there are significant numbers of people, as you will know, and as we know here as well, who don't buy into this new these new political ideologies, who look at them with disdain and confusion and bewilderment. Um, perhaps they're not being as vocal as we would like on this issue just yet. That might come. I think that remains to be seen. But to what extent do you think that you know, the populist uprisings we've seen over the past few years, for example, the vote for Brexit, the vote for Trump, the vote for various new parties in Europe, all of which were very clear statements by largely working class people to say, enough is enough of you guys. The establishment, you've lost the plot. You're not interested in our lives anymore. You are harming us economically and culturally, and we're going to take a stand what is the possibility that we will see something like that blow up in relation to what's been happening over the past six or seven weeks, do you think? Well, uh, Wilders and Millet, like Trump, are all are both extremely pro-Israel. Um, I believe that um, Wilders worked on a moshav, on a farm in Israel um, at a formative time, and um, Millet has considered converting to Judaism <laughs> Uh, runs around with a big um, Israeli flag, just like Trump. Um, and to me, it's like if these guys are a reflection of working class sentiment and rage at the elites, uh, I think you're absolutely right to 
to point out that um, Israel is is a part of that. Um, I, I was one of these people who, when it came to the war in Ukraine, I found myself saying a lot like, look, America first. You know, we ha- I was interviewing a lot of working class people for my next book. And a lot of them were bringing it up to me. They were so upset at this these billions of dollars and they can't afford to feed their kids and we're giving all this money away. Um, and to me, it seemed like, first of all, um, Ukraine was not a good client state. It was never going to be a real democracy. It was never going to be free of corruption. It was never going to carry water for us in the way that you kind of want um, a good ally to do. Um, I also felt that we were a little bit responsible for the invasion. I felt that Putin had been poked um, very intentionally. um, And I think that he felt that what he was doing was the only way to protect his national interests. And I could see that as a reasonable argument. I mean, of course, any war is disastrous and Putin himself is is very much a murderous thug. But the rationale specifically for invading Ukraine, I felt that we we could have prevented that and then we could have stopped it and we could have stopped it. And instead we kept um, pushing forward more and more and more. And I found myself saying, you know, like, look, America first, like, why, why are we, why is this territorial dispute our problem? What are we getting out of it? Um, there are now people who agreed with me about that, who feel very similarly about Israel and are using that same language to say, it's not just America first, but uh, we should be isolationist in nature. So I've been thinking a lot about like, well, I don't feel that way when it comes to Israel. Am I just a hypocrite? Is it just because I'm Jewish? Like, is it, or or is there a reasonable America first argument to be made that says Israel is actually part of that objectively, not just because I want it to be. Um, and the just the wall-to-wall support from members of Congress Um, And from these populist leaders who see themselves as the return of the repressed working class, right, as an expression of working class rage, which includes a commitment to the Jewish state. Um, I, I, I took heart in that because when I was thinking to myself, well, no, like the reason that Israel is different is because it's literally fighting our wars for it. I mean, we're kind of getting a bargain here because it's taking on Iran's proxies. And if there's this new kind of, you know, I don't want to say axis of evil because I don't think we should be invading, but if there's this new, let's say network, this anti-America, anti-Western network made up of the Chinese Communist Party, which is very much in a Cold War against us, um, Iran, and then the universities that hate us and are trying to undermine everything that's good about America very explicitly, right? Um, um, If this is a kind of new network, um, you have to fight each of these on its turf, right? You fight the Chinese Communist Party by creating an economy in America that empowers our workers, not theirs, and by, you know, banning TikTok, let's say, so they can't Set, you know, export propaganda for free. You fight the university system by creating an economy in which um, the working class no longer has to bear not only the sneering of the elites, but the fact that the elites are the only ones who get the American dream. You give them back their power, their economic power, and they will become an, a political force once again. And you fight Iran by fighting its proxies, who are Hezbollah and Hamas, Um, who are fighting us in Israel. Um, So to me, it seems very clear that um, the America first rationale is the way that Donald Trump saw it, which is it includes Israel as part of that. Um, Israel is very much an ally that carries its own weight. In fact, in normalizing relations with Saudi Arabia, it's doing something we wouldn't have been able to do on our own, which is bringing the Saudis back in. With that comes oil prices, right? I mean, there's a lot there that benefits America, Americans, regular Americans. Americans in their pocketbooks that we would not be able to accomplish without Israel's help. And that Israel, the Saudis amazingly are still interested in normalizing after all of this. So that's really like, I mean, that's probably by the grace of God, but anyway, um, so that, that's kind of how I see it. But so, but I, I'm still always saying, okay, but do you really, is this real? What are the arguments against this? Is the far isolationist right correct that Israel should not be part of it? Is the left correct that Ukraine should have been a part of it? But you know, the working class feels the way that I do. I mean, it's the polling, it's their representatives.
narratives. It's this, the populist energy in America is very pro-Israel. And so in terms of somebody who tries very much to be, who I see myself as a corrective of trying to get the working class voice back into the public sphere, I took a lot of heart from that. But I, you know what? I could be wrong. Like it's, it's an open question to me. I don't hold it against anybody who sees it differently than me. I, you know, been thinking a lot. Was I wrong about Ukraine? I'm thinking a lot. Am I wrong about Israel? Like just trying to always have good faith people who are willing to challenge me on these questions because they're, they are extremely important questions. If you're a regular listener to this show or a regular reader of Spiked, why not become a Spiked supporter? Spiked Supporters is our thriving community of people who donate to Spiked. Anyone who gives £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year can become a Spiked supporter and get access to lots of exciting perks. Spiked supporters can comment on articles, get free and discounted tickets to events, get a discount on all items in our shop and bookmark articles as you browse. This is our way of saying thank you to all of you who fund our work. Spiked is completely free, and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to make sure that anyone, anywhere can read us and listen to us. We're incredibly grateful for your generosity. If you don't give to Spiked yet, now is the perfect time to start. Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to set up your donation and your Spike supporters account. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. I think the way you've outlined it there is really interesting. A kind of network of, I don't know if we'd want to call it evil, but network of anti-American forces. Um the monolith of China uh, over the horizon, and then the threats faced by Israel from um, Iranian-backed proxies, and then what's going on on our own campuses, in our own universities, in terms of the turn against Western civilization, Western values, American values. That's a really good way of putting it. And, and as you say, all need to be combated on their own fronts, which means intellectually, uh, militarily and then economically, and and I think that kind of clarity of vision is important. But of course, it's very often lacking amongst the establishment um, in both in Britain and also in the United States. And one thing that really worried me recently, I read a report about how lots of young staffers at the White House um, called a meeting. Uh, I think they talked to some of Biden's people and basically said, we're getting it wrong on Israel. We're being too pro-Israel. It didn't have a huge amount of detail and everyone it quoted was anonymous, this piece I read. Um, But it did make me think about something that you will have thought about a lot over the years, which is the knock-on effect of campus culture when they enter into politics, when they enter into the media, which you've written about extensively, when they enter into the uh, 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 diplomatic circles and they're the people talking to Iranians or talking to the Chinese or whatever else it might be. And if they bring that politics of white is bad and, and brown is victimhood or America is a nation born in sin, uh, the, sin of colo- the sin of slavery and the sin of empire, uh, the West is pockmarked by, you know, all the horrible things it did in the past. You just think if they bring that mentality, are they going to have the ability intellectually, morally, and sometimes militarily where needed to stand up to their enemies and their opponents? And, and I think that's probably one of the big questions of our time, I would say. Yeah, definitely. And I think that um, uh, President Biden's kind of stalwart support for Israel amidst all of this pressure I, I will never forget that he did that. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to vote for him, if it's between him and, and Trump, but I, I will say that I think that he looked at the landscape and knew that he might, that standing by Israel might cost him the election. I mean, I think that analysis is wrong, but I think he may have thought that and that he decided to do it anyway. And I mean, God bless him for that. It's, it's an incredible, incredible thing. I will say I recently was watching a documentary about um, Margaret Thatcher and <laughs> the Falkland Islands, um, and she really hated the foreign office. And she was interviewed in the documentary and, you know, not to say too many nice things about Margaret Thatcher, but um, she, um, she one of the things she said is they were all about appeasement, appeasement, appeasement. And she just 
hated that. She hated the worship of weakness and the kind of we're going to meet them at the, you know, at the weakest point. That's where we meet and we negotiate. And I thought, wow, this stuff isn't that new, is it? You know, like this was really she she just was in a war with them over this exact question. And of course, the gender dynamics, I'm sure, played into it. And, you know, her whole psychodrama with the elites and everything. But it, it did seem like all all of the people from the foreign office, of course, had that, you know, elite British accent and were lords and everything. And and she, she just felt that from that, pos- that elite position, they would demand that, you know, everybody else kind of meet at the, it was a race to the bottom. And I thought, wow, that, it's so funny that that was <laughs> nothing new under the sun. <laughs> Yeah. And I I keep thinking of the word appeasement in relation to so much of the Western discussion about Hamas. You know, it's just moral appeasement is is sadly what we're seeing from so many influential uh, players. Um, Okay, I want to ask you a couple of questions about a man you have mentioned a couple of times in this chat, Donald Trump. Um, uh, I mean, that's a whole podcast in itself, Donald Trump and what's going on there. But I did want to ask you about something everyone is thinking about. What is the possibility of him coming back? What is the possibility of him running? What's the possibility of him winning? Because I think one thing that's clear, and we see this not only in the US and the UK, but around the world, uh, around the Western world anyway, the, the populist spirit has not gone away. You know, whenever a kind of old technocratic politician is returned to power in some country, uh, you know, the the elites breathe a sigh of relief and they think, great, everything's back to normal. Everything is not back to normal. People are still bristling and they want change and they want to be the corrective to the excesses of the establishment, uh, the moral disarray of the establishment and the economic um, self-interest of the establishment that is hurt in so many working class communities. People are really, really ticked off with all of that. What form do you think that will take in the US? Trump was never the perfect instrument for it. I think we would agree on that. He was sometimes a bit of a crude cudgel, but one that people felt it necessary to pick up and use it against an establishment that had turned its backs on them. Is it possible he'll come back? Do people want him back? What's your view? Um, I increasingly, with hindsight, see how much he did for the working class, both psychologically and in terms of economic, pure economics. Um, I think it, it looking just at the polling, let's say just today, this week, it seems very hard to imagine a scenario in which he won't be the next president. He's crushing Biden. Biden's losing black voters to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. by big numbers and some to Trump. Um, that's why I think this whole idea that Biden's going to lose because of Israel is just nonsense. I mean, he's he's hemorrhaging support to Donald Trump, who's much more pro-Israel than he is. Um, and he's losing, the Democrats have been co- consistently losing um, working class people of color um, over the last 10 years to, to Trump. Um, and so it seems like to me, he's if you're just looking at the polling, like snapshot, say we're a year out, but he seems pretty favored to win right now. Um, I think a lot of people would love um, somebody who had his policies, but not his personality. But when you look at um, what the elites are doing to him right now, um, they people said this to me, the, the day he won, they said they're not going to be satisfied until he's in jail. And I said, how could you say that? This is America. Like... But it, it, it's not actually even that it's a coordinated attack. It's that every little bureaucrat thinks that they are sort of doing God's work. To f- But in, in the end, you have 91 indictments. And so you can look at 91 indictments in two ways. You could say 91 indictments, surely he's done one of those things, right? Which is how I think a lot of Democrats see it. Or you can look at 91 indictments and with every added ad- indictment be like, this is getting ridiculous. Like he surely didn't do all of them. And if he didn't do all of them, has he done any of them? It's a witch hunt, right? And that's how increasingly a lot of people are seeing it. And I think even a lot of people who didn't like him and didn't vote for him. And I've heard from people who said, you know, I never would have voted for him, but I'm going to vote for him now because it's so disgusting the way they came after him. And if you're a working class person, you look at this and you say, well, look what they're doing to him him. He was so powerful. Like, you know, what are they going to do to me? What would they do to me? So he's come even more to become an avatar for working class rage against these very elites who think that they're, you know, quote unquote, saving democracy by, you know, 
taking somebody off the ballot <laughs> who was like democratically elect- elected. So, um, you know, the personality thing, a lot of people don't like it, but none of the Republicans were able to, Ron DeSantis really had an opening um, to say, look, I'm going to be the Trump candidate of the next generation. And he really messed it up um, through the campaign. He really failed to understand what the Trump um, phenomenon was all about. And so, you know, Trump's been 50 points ahead, you know, for six months now, and it's hard to see that going away. Um, Yeah. I mean, it's so obviously a witch hunt to... uh, any neutral observer can surely see that. And uh, it, pro-Trump people in the American electorate will certainly be able to see it and it will make them very, very angry, I'm sure. You know, it's interesting to hear you say that even people who weren't necessarily big fans of Trump have been made uncomfortable by the establishment's attempt to stitch him up. We, we've seen something a little bit similar here in, in Britain where, of course, when we voted for Brexit in 2016, there was... Uh, an on an ongoing attempt by the elites to prevent that vote from going through, to water it down, to make sure that we half stayed in the EU and half came out, if if at all, on the basis that the voters didn't know what they were voting for. We were uh, our minds were turned to mush by demagogues, by the tabloids, by the evil uh, low rent newspapers. I mean, that is basically what they said, and they're still doing it. They are still playing that card. A survey came out last week, a a, a so-called scientific survey, saying that um, people who voted for Brexit were objectively less intelligent than people who voted for Remain. So they're just going for it again and again. And I've seen quite a few people say, look, I voted for Remain, um, but we lost in June 2016. And I'm now so horrified by this attempt to stop Brexit from happening and by the demonization of Brexit voters that if I got my go again, I would vote for Brexit. So that it's a very similar situation, even though, of course, the vote for Brexit is not like a vote for a president. Um, What's your own personal view? It's interesting to see you, hear you say um, that in hindsight, you you started to recognise the um, interesting, positive things that Trump did um, psychologically and economically for working class communities. That's a really interesting way to put it. What's your view now? You don't necessarily have to tell us who you plan to vote for. Uh, if, uh, but if you want to, you can. Um, what's your view on Trump? Do you think that he was a crude instrument, but a necessary one? Do you think that was over egged? Maybe he wasn't as ridiculous as the media constantly made out. Um, it, it, does your hindsight extend to thinking that obviously he wasn't Hitler 2.0, which was the ridiculous relativistic argument that was made by lots of observers and radicals over the past few years? But has your view changed on um, him as a person, him as a president? Do you see him differently now than you might have done a few years back? Yeah, I do. Um, I, it would be dishonest for me not to say that I feel... I f- can feel when I see him, I see images of him, I see, you know, um, that I see him through a different light, having spent the year traveling the country and interviewing working class people about what he meant to them. Um, and I, I'm trying to like pinpoint when it changed. Cause I, I started out having the Trump derangement syndrome in like 2016. I was like, I took it very personally and blah, blah, blah. And then I remember when I kind of shed that, the hatred and I was just would roll my eyes and be like, you know, then I was in the necessary, but blunt instrument stage. Um, And then at some point over the last year, um, I started to see him very differently. And I started to think, um, you know, somebody with a greater sense of their own dignity, let's say, (laughs) to put it bluntly, could never have accomplished what he accomplished because you have to understand as you do, he took on both parties, both parties. Like imagine standing up and saying, I'm going to have no home. I'm going to fight both fronts because of course it was a handshake deal between Democrats and Republicans to sell out the working class in this country for decades. And to say, um, I am going to take on both parties and stand alone and represent you people. Um, You have to have a kind of, a normal person can't do that. A normal person can't do that. Um, It's it's very, very hard. Um, And it's, and to have done that and to have succeeded from a policy point of view, um, you have to not just not care what people think, you have to thrive off of 
poking them exactly in the eye where it hurts them the most. And so now when I think, did he say anti-Semitic racist things? Sometimes he did. Is he a person fundamentally with no sense of, of dignity? It, he is. Um, but when I think about like, those are concerns for people who whose bank accounts have like a nice retirement fund in them. And those are not concerns for people who don't know um, whether they're going to be able to pay the electric bill. And um, so I, I did change a lot on that front. And I see him now as somebody who, um, it, like the psychic impact of having a leader who hated the elites and loved the people um, was enormous. Even though a lot of them said to me, you know, I wish he, you know, he was less civil. I wish the temperature would come down. But also they, and I think they were right, they very much saw the reaction to him as being much worse than anything he ever did. And I think that's accurate. Um, you know, so, so, and now of course we could, in hindsight, there's, you know, the Russia gate hoax, the women's March, which was organized by this anti-Semite, right? Like, you know, the, the, like so much of the, um, the opposition to him in hindsight was so psychotic and so beyond the pale. Um, so, did that make him even worse? Of course, it made him worse. Did it make him more angry? Of course. Um, you know, was January 6th, a, you know, a terrible day? Yeah, it was a bad day. But um, at the end of the day, you know, 700 miscreants, like committing acts of trespassing. Like, is that really like a threat to our democracy? It's not. Our democracy is extremely robust. And so much of what happens in the name of, quote unquote, protecting democracy and defending against, quote unquote, misinformation are attacks on democracy and is misinformation. And he so represents that. And so I I, I have changed very much how I see him and even his personality. Yeah, even though I, you know, my mom, um, she's um, very, very, very religious. And she's one of the 4% of Americans who votes on foreign policy and she wouldn't vote for him because he made fun of a disabled person. And she, 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 and I, I remember I felt so, you know, I continue to feel proud of her for that, even though I, you know, I, I see him so differently now. Like that was it for her. Like she, she closed the door and she never looked back, even though the policies, you know, great, you know, whatever. So she sees things a little bit differently. Um, and I respect a lot. Of, there's a lot of Orthodox Jews who feel that way. Um, they feel that his character was not up to par, that it's a bad example for the children that it teaches the children that like because he'll trump will say something outrageous and the parents will laugh and then it teaches them that that's funny or that that's acceptable and they you know that's not great it's not great but again like you know i would love for the country to get to a place where everybody had the privilege of of casting their vote based on those issues yeah uh i really agree that elite trump derangement syndrome was always worse than anything Trump did. Even, you know, the craziest things he did or the craziest things he said, uh, the derangement syndrome was always worse. It, it seems it seemed clear to me that it always posed a far larger threat to democracy, to a free speech, um, to the right of working class communities to choose their leaders without being demeaned or having their votes undermined in some way. Trump derangement syndrome was always uh, clearly a, a, a nastier and more elitist and more anti-democratic trend than anything that Trump did when he was in power. That that was uh, always fairly clear, I think. Um, okay, this it brings me on to my final question for you, Bacha, which is about, um, I think I might have asked you this last time as well, which is just about whether you feel optimistic. One of the reasons I ask you this is because I often feel optimistic when I read your writing. I mean, firstly, it has, I really do, it has great, firstly, because it has great moral clarity, but also because you are one of the few writers who are able to really articulate um, the concerns and the aspirations and the rebellious feeling of working class communities. And it's a really useful reminder that those people are out there, however much the establishment would like to ignore them. So I do feel optimistic when I re read you. Um, but I also, you know, in some ways we live in a very dark moment. We have just come out of the one of the worst acts of racist barbarism of modern times. Um, too many people in the West have apologized for it and justified it. So we have reason to be horrified and depressed. Um, but at the same time, as you have said, um, there is still that corrective that is embodied in the working class vote. In many ways, there is that um, instinct for 
amongst ordinary people to shake politics up, to make it better, to make their own lives better economically, culturally, and to push back against the establishment that is doing the opposite. So when you weigh those things up, do you feel optimistic, pessimistic about politics in America and politics in the Western world? How are you feeling? Uh, I feel very optimistic and I'm glad that's coming across. <laughs> <laughs> um, I So my my next book will be out in April. And when I first started writing it, I called it Unpromised Land because I was writing about the working class and I felt that we had broken our social contract with them. Um, and then as I started reporting it, I felt that that was too bleak because the situation was a lot more complicated. There were working class people who had achieved the middle class. Um, there were people who were struggling. There were people in the middle. But I had found, you know, there was a lot of, you know, optimism and hope and love for this country. So I changed it to promised land. And then when this war broke out, we decided that sounded like it was about Israel. And so now the book is called Second Class. <laughs> um, but of course, that's a much easier fix. And I, I do think that um, um, I, I, I feel so heartened by the good hearted nature of Americans and I saw a video, you know, the other day of a cabbie in, in London um, with a thick, thick Cockney accent kicking a bunch of people out of the cab for saying anti-Semitic thing. He was just like, get out. I don't want to hear this. And, you know, I I wept like it was so moving. And I, I think there's a million things like that happening every day. And um, I do feel that the I, I do feel that um, there the elites are in retreat, or at least there's a sense of kind of sheepishness about them. Although that might be wishful thinking on my part, um, and I I feel so proud to be American and to be a Jew, and I hope you feel very proud of the work that you do. And there's just when people like you are out there shining a beacon of light um, on this on this whole angry scene. It's just it, it it's very hard for me to feel anything but optimistic and hopeful. And um, I wonder if you would allow me to end by giving you a blessing. Yes. So I, I open by saying how much your work has meant to me and um, how it has made me feel so much less alone and um, so much stronger in this fight. And I want to bless you um, that God should watch over you and everybody you love should be blessed um, and so that you can continue to do this important work and, and thrive as you are. Uh, thank you so, so much, Brendan. Bacha, thank you very much.